Welcome everyone, my name is Stan Mickelson, your select board member, your host of my program, Your Town. I'm pleased to introduce my guests this morning, Mr. Chris Michaud, Director of Health down at Dartmouth, and Ms. Tanya Johnson, Senior Vice President and Chief Oper Operations Officer of South Coast Hospitals Group. Thank you very much both for being here. Um, so uh, one little comment. Uh, it, it, uh, this, I feel very, very odd in this room that we haven't been in over two years. And it, um, um, it's wonderful to be back here. Um, hopefully we're back here full time at some point also. Sorry for getting away from things. But so um, the program this morning is a discussion about what else, COVID. Um, and the members of the Dartmouth residents that decided not to get vaccinated, if you want to fight COVID, get your shots. It's the only way I can, I can believe at this point that's going to help you and your families and your friends. So um, I'd like to uh, start out, uh, Ms. Johnson, um, I'd like to give you a free will here and what you'd like to discuss. Um, um, so the mic shows. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am privileged to oversee all the vaccination efforts for South Coast Health and, and the vaccine clinics. And really what you said is absolutely true. The only way we're really going to make a difference and we're going to beat this pandemic is to get vaccinated. We're still seeing a lot of people have hesitancy against vaccination, but I'm really thrilled to say we continue to see people show up for first doses in the clinics. Um, every single time we run a clinic, we see people show up for their first doses and, it's and, wonderful. and thrilled to see that. Um, if you have any second thoughts that this, this vaccination does not work, uh, you're misinformed, this vaccination does work and it will save lives, your life maybe, your kid's life, your family's. Um, I, I, I don't know, you see so much, people look at a lot of social media, unfortunately, and that's mostly untrue, most of it. Um, it's, it's not, it's not fact-based at all. It's just how some people feel. Some, um, you look at the media today and they're on both sides of the fences and they, so it's politi politicized. So I think the best thing for us to do as, as, um, as myself as a select board member and it really, really we're very concerned as a board. That's why I, I did this today to, to uh, Maybe if we can save four or five people from making a bad choice and not getting vaccinated, we'd be, I'll be very happy that we spent this last half hour or so and that we've done something to, to, to make somebody's life better and safer. Um, I don't know any other, I don't know the reason why they're not doing it. Um, and uh, I don't know what the statistics are. I don't know if enough people have been asked that question. Uh, they say no, but why? And you never see it. You never see their answers. Um, and um, but uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, you're seeing an upswing on the first first time uh, shots for people, and that's that to me is heartwarming. And I'm, I'm really, this is why we're here today. Yeah, I think that you raise a good point. You know, a lot of false information out in the media, social media in particular. Um, but we have been asking that question, you know, why now? Why show up for the first dose now? I think Omicron, this new variant, mm -hmm. has been spread very easily. And what we're hearing from people that are showing up for their first dose now are saying, wow, you know, someone I know or someone I love has recently been ill and they did end up in the hospital and they weren't vaccinated and they yeah. became very ill and potentially some of them actually didn't survive. Right. And they're saying, I don't want that to be my story. I want my story to look different. I want a, my story to look like someone who I've seen who was vaccinated, who had a booster dose, who had what looked like the common cold, very minor symptoms right, right, right. And, and fared much better. Yeah. And that is what we're seeing. And that's the story we're hearing in the clinics from those individuals that are now showing up, you know, a year, two years into the pandemic. Crazy. Um, you know, speaking of uh, infection rate, this, um, so unvaccinated residents are 31 times more likely to become infected than fully vaccinated, vaccinated residents who have received a booster shot. 
In another statistic, COVID hospitalization, 30% fully vaccinated um, have uh, hospitalized. 67% are hospitalized unvaccinated. I can't make these statistics up. It, it says it all. Um, and you just mentioned it again. Uh, uh, your opportunity to survive uh, the COVID uh, disease with a, with a minimum of two or one shot and, and a booster are very, very high. And I'm sure we've all had common colds over our lives. And it's just about a common cold almost. Well, I think the other thing to point out about that 30, you know, 37% that are vaccinated, those most often are individuals with other comorbidities, you know, other um, illnesses or immunocompromised, so undergoing cancer right. treatment, who may not have had a robust response mm -hmm. to the vaccine. Um, so the vaccine didn't give them the immune response that it may have had in a more healthy individual or a person that wasn't immunocompromised due to their medical conditions or the treatments or medications they were taking. Um, so not necessarily um, an equal um, chance for them to get the same kind of protection from the vaccine that others might have. Yeah. What should I know about vaccines for children and teens? Um, you know, I think there's some hesitancy around, you know, I don't know what the response is to vaccines. I don't know what the long-term effects are of the vaccine. Um, you know, but I think we can say that about COVID, too. We don't know what the long-term effects are of contracting COVID. Uh, we do know that people that are vaccinated that do end up contracting COVID have a much less viral response to COVID, um, similar to a common cold versus severe illness, potentially hospitalization and death. Um, and so we know that vaccines work and that's why people need to get vaccinated. The clinical trials have been very successful. It's evidence-based. Um, you know, it went through the same rigorous process that any other vaccine, vaccines against measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox, things that we don't even <coughs> see or hear about anymore that are- We take for granted. Yeah, that are kind of required to enter schools these days. Um, and no one even blinks an eye on that. Um, and yet we have so much debate over vaccines for COVID in the same age group and populations right now. But I do urge parents um, to do due diligence, um, do your homework, uh, and, and you'll see if you bring, if you look at enough information, not online, online, but not not, not through Facebook, that you'll see that the the, the, cho the choices are probably very positive that, uh, that in, in favor of vaccinating your children, and uh, I, I I can't make you make the decision for you, but it will be a good decision to do that. Um, so the other thing is um, the vaccination, vaccination sites, um, how, how are they right now? Um, I know South Coast is doing something at the old Vanity Fair. Correct. And that's where I, I had my shots or quite a while ago now. But uh, could you talk a little more about that and the other sites that are around town? Sure. Um, so South Coast is running two smaller sites at our Truesdale location um, and Rosebrook location. So they're running Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we do have the larger site at Vanity Fair, which is at 375 Fawns Corner Road um, on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And then we run a 5 to 11-year-old clinic on Tuesday evening. Um, and we purposely separated that age group just from a safety perspective. Yeah, very good. Um, but then you can also go to mass.gov slash vaccinations and you can log in, you know, zip codes and find out other locations where you can get vaccinated. Um, our partners in the retail pharmacy space as well as community health centers are also sharing in that work and those efforts as well. The numbers are still strong. We're seeing a good turnout um, at the clinics, uh, especially since we've been able to open up to walk-ins. Yeah, um, yeah. Some hesitancy when you have to make an appointment, but kind of spur of the moment, we've seen a good turnout with walk-in. Yeah, that's wonderful. I've heard some from quite a few people that uh, emails to me um, about uh, the boost shot, that they feel comfortable with the one or two shots that they've had. Um, but how, how, in your opinion, how important is that boost shot? Um, we've seen definite increased effectiveness against the disease with the booster shot. Um, I think just with the additional Omicron variant being in play, 
the booster definitely increases the effectiveness and um, the ability to decrease the chance of hospitalization and severe illness with the booster, so I would definitely recommend it. Um, the CDC is recommending five months after the initial series mm -hmm. for adults, 12 years and up. So going from one side of the spectrum to the other, uh, what about the seniors? Um, definitely seniors would highly recommend a booster. I mean, they're the most vulnerable. Um, they're the most at risk for severe illness and disease. And they were the f very first ones to get right. shots. Right, so they're the longest out right. from the initial right. series, right. 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 correct. I wonder what the statistics are as far as seniors. Uh, um, how are the, Chris, how, how are the, um, the nursing homes doing? So early in the pandemic, in the spring of 2020, uh, they got caught off guard. Um, you know, PP was in short supply, and uh, PP was the only method um, of controlling uh, spread in these congregate facilities, uh, aside from isolation, when possible, which was difficult. So um, we saw um, once PPE did arrive in adequate um, supply, um, that whether it be nursing homes, assisted livings, other congregate care locations were able to um, implement very successful infection control um, sporadically um, as a result of probably asymptomatic transmission. Um, a lot of the restrictions that got lifted um, with visitation, um, it did sneak back in, but it didn't sneak back into these um, types of facilities with the virulence that it had in the springtime. Um, so these locations are all doing a lot better, um, you know, statewide, and that information is all accessible on the state's uh, dashboard. With this new Omicron, um, it is highly infectious, am I correct? Yeah, easily transmissible, highly infectious, um, definitely seeing many, many people turn up positive. Yeah, that's why that big spike in the last, what, four or five months? Somewhere uh, around there. Well, we ran into almost like a, um, it wasn't two surges, but it was a surge that kind of moved into, you know, the Delta surge from Thanksgiving. Um, we never got to see the downward trend like we did last year. We ended up seeing that transition into the Omicron surge um, that made it into Massachusetts in early December, and then DPH announcing that Omicron was um, prevalent throughout Massachusetts around December 15th. Mm. And we're, we're probably a little bit on the, the downward side of that slope right now um, here in Dartmouth as well as Massachusetts. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, follow up on that. Um, you're seeing that, I'm sure, in, in, through the hospital. Correct, yeah. Hopefully that's, uh, that's a good sign. Yes, we're optimistic. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> that, that, that does happen. One thing that um, is notable, however, is that um, up until December, we didn't see any home testing of a uh, great number. Uh, with the uh, widespread availability now of home test kits and manufacturing adjusting to the demand, um, there's a lot of people that are testing positive that we're not receiving those results. So when you look at those case, case counts from Massachusetts, um, just understand that those are the, those are the results um, when someone went to a clinical site and got a positive. If you did a home test, chances are that that is not getting entered in. Um, there are a few, but the vast majority are not. That's interesting because that's one of my other questions. Um, I know the government is offering home tests to every, every person in the country. I recently went away um, over Christmas and New Year's and um, I got, I left, the, I was out of the country, and um, I went to an island, and we were tested four times at that facility for various reasons, but four times, once coming in, two times during the stay, and then once more to come back to the United States. Um, and, and a segue into that, um, there was, um, what is it, PFR, is that what it is, PER? PCR. PCR. Um, only one of the four times was the PCR coming back into this country. The rest were, you know, uh, just that regular test that they do today. Um, how accurate is that? How, and how accurate could be these home tests? 
So, I mean, the antigen and the PCR tests have different levels of sensitivity and specificity, right. and, and they all vary by brand and mm -hmm. degree. Um, you know, I think they're better than no testing, right? Yeah. Um, and so the more we can make testing available and readily available for people is certainly a move in the right direction. Um, yeah. Um, um, but, um, well, testing is testing, I'm, and, and God bless everybody that's getting out there and getting tested. They want to know, uh, if, but they, uh, what are the symptoms uh, initially before you really, there's an onslaught of this uh, Omicron uh, uh, reaction? So, I mean, the symptoms vary person to person, and they are general respiratory symptoms, you know, um, Certainly the telltale symptoms is loss of taste and smell. That's sort of the classic um, COVID, mm -hmm. but general respiratory symptoms, you know, sniffles, sore throat, fever, headache, body aches. So, so it can be very easily, you know, cross matched with the flu, mm -hmm. with other cold symptoms or cold viruses. So it's very hard to differentiate whether it's COVID or some other normal respiratory virus that occurs during the winter time and so that's why testing is important but quite frankly the general you know advice is if you don't feel good stay home stay away from people right. wash your hands wear a mask um, and assume that you're contagious right <laughs> right yeah and um, hopefully people pay attention to that because um, it's again how it's so highly contagious that it, it is um, it's not a good choice to uh, go to work. Right. <laughs> Period. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. To mingle with the public. Um, stay home. It won't last that long. You'll feel you'll feel good. I'm sure in a very short time. Hopefully you make it through it. Get it. Get a shot. You got to get shots. <laughs> I'll say that a hundred times. You got to get shots. Can't so, say it enough. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. Um, so, um, anything else that you think is, in, in your mind, um, is really important before we, we sign off on this program? You know, I, I like to say I am, yes, I'm in charge of vaccination, and I work for South Coast. I'm a registered nurse, but I'm also a mom, and I'm a mom to an immunocompromised child. And so I like to say, you know, you can do it because of the evidence, you can do it for yourself, but do it for somebody else, right? get vaccinated for somebody else. I say get vaccinated because of my daughter. For the immunocompromised people that may not be able to have that robust response to vaccination, because if my daughter contracts the disease, she's more likely to die. One in 10 of immunocompromised people are likely to die, and she can't protect herself. So do it for your best friend or another loved one or someone else in the community. Um, that's what looking out for each other if you can't do it for yourself or because of what you read, do it for somebody else. Um, and so that would be my parting words. Thank you. It's wonderful, and I'm sorry about your daughter. <laughs> uh, Mr. Michaud. Thank you. Uh, so there's just one quick question I'd like to ask Ms. Johnson, because it's something that, you know, I've certainly had a lot of experience with, um, and it's something that maybe a lot of people are not aware of that um, we should be long haulers, the people that get infected and suffer long-term complications, people of routine health, younger age, and, you know, fight long-term fatigue and brain fog. Um, have you seen anything with the vaccine that might de reduce the risk of long haulers? Um, Hauling, I, I, it's, it really isn't talked about much. It's still talked about a little bit, but um, that scares me as an individual. I don't want to fight any of that over the long term. Yeah, you know, um, there isn't a lot of information out there about that. What there is information is sort of individuals that contract COVID. Um, they do say about 75% of those individuals, and there's just been an article out in the American uh, Medical Association that talks about, you know, one, three out of four individuals that have COVID kind of in the severity of illness that requires hospitalization still report six months, seven months after that illness of that tiredness or at least one significant still long-term effect that has kind of lingered on, whether it's shortness of breath, long-term fatigue, headache, um, you know, something that continues to bother them long-term. We don't hear that from people that are vaccinated. They're not reporting that same kind of long-term impact. Right. right. 
right? Um, you know, but I think time will tell. You know, we, it's still too early in the stage to understand that completely, but what we do know is that people that contracted the disease at a significant level of illness requiring hospitalization are still reporting long-term effects from that illness. Chris, anything else you want to say? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the other thing I'd like to just kind of close with is that it builds on what Ms. Johnson said earlier about if you're not feeling well, stay home, stay away from others, do the right thing. That has always been a uh, practice that we should have all been doing. Uh, we need to be more aware of it now. And also, trust your doctor. Um, and it doesn't have to be on this issue particularly, but on all issues. Um, these are highly credentialed people that went into medicine public service. Um, they, they go through great sacrifice individually. Um, they give up a lot to go into that profession, and they do it to help us. And that, you know, when a doctor tells you to do something or advises you, I shouldn't say tell you, they advise you. And, um, you know, listen to them. They're looking out for your interests as a patient. And, you know, we select them because of a trust. It's not like, you know, you just, you know, this is the doctor that you're assigned. So. Um, I know enough to do certain little things on a car, um, but I'm not a mechanic, so I'm not going to pull my engine apart. So I'm not a doctor, and I'm not going to pretend to be one. So you know, those out there that are giving medical advice uh, that are not doctors, please stop that. You're convincing others without the proper education and credentials, and you know that's really what I want to emphasize, just broadly. Um, we've, we're facing a lot of things in a very um, unique time with civilization. Um, we've got tick-borne diseases at ever-increasing amounts. Um, you know, we've got you know m concerns about prescription medication with painkillers. Uh, those things haven't gone away. Those things are still all around us. So just you know, please, when you go for your annual, if you feel something that's not usual, um, don't let it be diminished. You know, I just heard a tragic story about someone that ignored some conditions and ended up passing prematurely, very healthy person uh, from sepsis. So please, you know, contact your doctors. We've got uh, portals like with South Coast now, you can ask your doctors uh, remotely. Um, and, you know, as always, there are certain key things through all of this, um, you know, where you should call 911, and I would just like to ask Ms. Johnson to just elaborate on that because in the early days of the pandemic, and we heard about it um, more recently during the surge, people not calling 911 when they should. Yeah, so as you just alluded to, Chris, thank you. Um, please, if you have a health condition, it's not time to delay. Um, seek emergency care, call 911 seek medical attention it you know it, it's not time to put off things we're still there we're still available to meet your health care needs go to the emergency department when it's warranted call your primary care physician continue to follow up on those medical c concerns your annual physicals um, mammograms colon screenings all of those things should still be happening um, it's not time to just stop all your health care needs because COVID exists we need to continue to care for you as we normally would so that something else doesn't become an emergency or something else doesn't become the reason why you know you have a, a, a health care emergency that was delayed or becomes something that just causes an adverse outcome that could have been prevented had you sought medical attention when it was warranted so please don't delay that medical care very good point thank you Chris also anything thank you okay um, Thank you both, really. Um, hopefully, we'll save a few lives. I, I, I truly hope so. Um, one last thing, get a shot. Get two shots. Get three shots. Get a shot. This concludes another program, program of your town. And thank you for all the kind emails and keep them coming. Thank you very much. See you next time.